This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show looking at the incredible community networks across the United States that are coming together to protect their neighbors during the coronavirus pandemic, and how you can get involved as lockdowns and layoffs sweep the country, leaving millions at risk. Mutual aid groups are forming to protect and provide for the vulnerable, including the elderly, incarcerated, undocumented and and unhoused. Their aim? Solidarity, not charity. In Washington, the Tacoma Mutual Aid Collective is organizing free food programs for kids hit by school closures. In the Bay Area of California, the West Oakland Punks with Lunch is working with the houseless community and distributing lunch and supplies. In Arizona, Tucson Mutual Aid is coordinating food and supply drop-offs to people's front doors. In Colorado, the Denver Service Worker Solidarity Group is building a network to demand an immediate moratorium on rent, collection and eviction. Citywide. In Minnesota, the Twin Cities Queer and Trans Mutual Aid Group is organizing assistance for queer, transgender, and gender non binary people affected by COVID 19. Here in New York City, now the epicenter in this country, NYC United Against Coronavirus has put together a network of resources for child care, grocery delivery, food donations, housing needs, bail funds, and other types of support across the five boroughs. And those are just a few of the thousands of efforts. For more, we go to two of the hot spots of the pandemic, Seattle, Washington, and here in New York City. We're joined by two longtime mutual aid organizers. In New York City, Mariam Kaba is with us, longtime organizer, abolitionist, education, and founder of the grassroots organization project. Nia, which works to end the incarceration of children and young adults. She's raised tens of thousands of dollars and redistributed it to groups across the country in response to the coronavirus pandemic. She just did a public conference call with Congressmember Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez on mutual aid. And in Seattle, Washington, Dean Spade is with us, associate professor at Seattle University School of Law, founder of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, creator of the mutual aid resource website, BigDoorBrigade.com. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! in this so difficult, trying, challenging time. Mariam, tell us about a few more of these mutual aid efforts and what you're doing. Sure. Um, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, um, there are several projects happening around the country. Um, I have been um, privy to seeing the work that's happening in Chicago, where um, Kelly Hayes, uh, Delia Galindo, and other organizers pulled together on very short notice um, a uh, Google Doc to help people with direct needs who needed uh, any number of dollars, whether for rent or food or et cetera, provided an opportunity for people to sign up and then for people to who could offer to support to step in to do that. Um, so that's one way that, through technology, people are reaching out to each other in order to be able to meet people's direct needs. Um, there are folks here in New York City, as you mentioned, uh, that pulled together uh, an abolitionist group, um, an abolitionist mutual aid fund that uh, raised money to be able to provide groceries to folks, um, grocery money to people. And explain uh, what you mean, Mariam, when you say abolitionist. Um, well, in this case, it was an abolitionist uh, collective, meaning people who are um, prison industrial complex abolitionists who believe that um, we need to create the conditions in the world to be able to uh, abolish prisons, policing, and surveillance. Um, so in this particular case, this grouping uh, came together. They're socialists, abolitionists, feminists, and they tried to raise money in order to be able to provide uh, grocery money for folks in the, um, uh, not just in New York, I think, beyond New York as well. Um, they got, I think this is an important point, which was that they raised a lot of money quickly, about nearly $40,000, but the requests that came in were $220,000. Um, and so you can see that there's an incredible need, and that need needs to find a way to get met. Um, and it won't just be happening through individual donations. It has to also be the state mobilizing to provide uh, for the needs of those people. So those are just some, a couple of examples. Uh, survived and Punished, um, New York, 
did a soap drive uh, to raise money so that soap could be sent inside uh, to incarcerated people, first in New York and now around the country. Because as you know, incarcerated people can be hired, for example, through Governor Cuomo to create um, hand sanitizer that would help the rest of the community, but they themselves can't have hand sanitizer um, within uh, the prisons because of the alcohols level within those particular um, uh, within that particular hand sanitizer. So trying to mobilize uh, to meet the material needs of the folks who need support um, and to have that res have that reciprocity uh, is key. Well, I want to go to Dean Spade. Mariam Kaba is in Brooklyn, New York, and Dean is in uh, Seattle, associate professor of Seattle University School of Law. Talk about the history of mutual aid for people who've never heard that term before. Yeah, the term mutual aid basically just means when people band together to meet immediate survival needs, usually because of a shared understanding that the systems in place aren't coming to meet them, or certainly not fast enough, if at all, and that we can do it together right now. So usually you see them really visibly during kind of sudden disasters like earthquakes, storms, floods, or people are rescuing each other or distributing water or distributing masks, things like that. But there's also an ongoing history of people um, and a contemporary reality of people doing mutual aid projects to deal with the ongoing disasters of the systems we live under. So an example a lot of people have heard of is no more deaths in Arizona, which puts um, water into the desert and food so that people who are crossing hopefully are less, le it's less mortal for them. Um, or abortion funds that help people access abortion right now, or bail funds, as you mentioned, or projects to help people coming out of foster care or out of prison find housing, or prison pen pal projects, or child care collectives. Those are all sort of the ongoing ways people are meeting each other's needs. And I think the most probably visible historical example of mutual aid in the U.S. that people talk about a lot is, of course, of course the uh, Black Panther parties, um, free breakfast programs and health programs. Um, which were a vital part of the party's work and have it's a good example of how social movements often pretty much always centrally um, organize mutual aid because people come into social movements to get immediate needs met and they also desperately want to help others facing what they're facing and when they're there they can build a shared analysis hey why don't we have food why don't we have shelter what systems are in place that we all actually want to get to the root causes of um, I think that's one other piece to say about this is that in a country like ours, the story is elites will solve the problems, we should change laws or we should get policies passed and you should kind of wait to vote for those people or, or lobby them and ask them to do things. And mutual aid has a really different feeling to it. It's like, you know what, we're not just going to wait and hope that they solve our problems, especially since they have a bad record of not doing that. Um, and especially because most relief doesn't end up reaching the poorest people or the most marginalized or targeted people. Instead, we're going to do something right now to build the world we want to live in. So it's a very empowering, participatory kind of work that tends to build people's ability to mobilize generally. And the, the idea of solidarity, not charity, Dean. Yeah. So charity is a word we often use to think about, like social services or nonprofits that give stuff to poor people if you qualify, if you meet these eligibility verification requirements, if you're the right kind of poor person. We don't give it to you unless you're sober or unless you take these meds or unless you have kids or, you know, there's histories unless you're properly Christian or not queer or whatever. Charity is this kind of thing where usually money's coming from the rich and they get to determine who is deserving. That's the opposite of solidarity, right? Solidarity is, wow, what people are in need. That's not because they've done something wrong and we need to find the good ones and reform them. It's because there's something wrong with a system that makes people homeless, that makes people criminalized, that makes people desperate and makes people, um, you know, have no immigration status, whatever the case may be. So it's a really different framework and it's not about saviorism or about um, elites determining who should get what relief, which is how charity looks. It's instead about all of us getting together and practically just trying to meet each other's needs and solve immediate problems together in a very um, grassroots bottom up way instead of a top down way. And, Mariam Kaba, we only have a few minutes. How do you hope to see these networks being developed in response to the pandemic evolve even after? And that's a hopeful question, thinking about after the pandemic. And also, um, where people can go to see uh, the kind of groups that they can support. 
Sure. Um, so I think one of the most important parts about mutual aid has to do with um, changing the social relationships that we have amongst each other in order to be able to fight beyond this current moment, beyond the current crisis, beyond the current form of a disaster that we're trying to overcome. Um, and so one of the beautiful aspects is that you really don't know where the connections are going to take you. Um, you're going to make and build new relationships that will kind of lead to new projects and will need, lead to new um, understandings uh, that will shape the potential future of, you know, your community and beyond. I think the fact that these are like hyper-local projects is actually a very helpful thing because you're definitely going to run into these folks again and they pro it provides a foundation for future political action um, if, if it's done in a good way where people feel good about it and good about each other. So I think that's very important. And um, in terms of where people can go to find some of these mutual aid projects, there's a new hub that was created um, that, uh, that somebody put together using all of these different um, uh, how do you call it, all the different Google Docs that have been coming up and circulating so that people could find each other and find themselves. And I will send that, um, because I don't have the actual link for it right now, um, but I will send that over so that you can put it on your site. Um, and that's a way where people can connect. Uh, people can go to Twitter, go to Instagram, go to Facebook. There's so many Facebook pages that have come up. So and we'll, many. Of course, we'll link to it at democracynow.org. Um, there have been calls um, by progressive prosecutors, DAs, and of course the whole abolitionist movement around the country to release people in jails at this critical point and detention centers. Can you quickly? We have just 20 seconds. Comment on this. Yes, absolutely. And I want to comment specifically for New York. Governor Cuomo has complete discretion to be able to issue mass clemencies uh, for the prisons. We know that uh, de Blasio, the mayor, has the power to be able to release hundreds and thousands of people from Rikers Island and other jails. Um, and so we really want them to be able to do that. There's lots of pressure and demands that have been issued by local groups. We're going to we leave it there, but I want to yep. thank you both for being with us. Marian Caba, organizer, abolitionist, founder, Project NIA, and Dean Spade, associate professor at Seattle University School of Law, founder of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, creator of mutual aid resource website, bigdoorbrigade.com. I want to just take this moment to thank the remarkable team of uh, family, my co-workers at Democracy Now!, um, who are mainly working from home. I want to thank Julie Crosby, Miriam Barnard, Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Shea, Carla Wills, Tammy Warrenoff, Libby Rainey, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Trina Nadura, Tamari Astudio, Dennis Moynihan, Adriano Contreras, Marie Tarasena. <laughs>